welcome to another episode of Out of the Woodwork Podcast, brought to you by Axminster Tools with me, Sean Evely. This week, I'll be speaking to a furniture making legend, John Makepeace, about his illustrious career in furniture craft and design. His work has taken him around the world, working for numerous notable clients as a design consultant and producing a wealth of high-end furniture. Not only that, John has set up and ran his own college for 25 years. Now amalgamated in the Architectural Association, there is no stopping him anytime soon as he continues to practice and take commissions from his historic home in Dorset, which he shares with his wife, Jenny. So John, thank you for joining me. It's an honor speaking with you today. Well, it's, it's fun being here. <laughs> yeah, well, so you're such a well-known maker and, and have made some fantastic pieces, but a lot of people might not know about how you got started and why you chose the direction of uh, woodworking. Can you tell us about the early days and what inspired you to start woodworking? We had two or three pieces of furniture in the house at home, which really spoke to me. And there was very little said about them. And then just one day, somebody said, oh, those are made by grandfather. Oh, really? And it was so, he died so such a long time before that, you know, I never knew him and I hadn't made the connection, but I could certainly tell that these things were special. Yeah. And, and that must have made an impact. Um, and the other thing was that uh, materials were quite hard to come by after the war. And uh, I, was, I was born just in the first year of, the, of the World War II, so 39. By 45, getting timber was very difficult. Um, so offcuts from the carpenter who came to repair our house after the war. Um, his offcuts were, were, were wonderful for me. Um, at 11, I saw really fine furniture making, a man called Hugh Burkett. And my mother took me there when she was going to talk to him about uh, possibly commissioning a table uh, as my father was leaving one of his, his uh, posts and they wanted to give him a, a present and this was a possible um, thing that they might have chosen. Yeah. Anyway, it was uh, that didn't work, but the, the furniture that we saw on that day was, was again another mark at, at 11. And you know, I really do believe young people learn so much about the world in their, you know, six to 12. And we, we seem to think that people are making career choices in their teenage years. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that's where the foundation lies. It, it's much, it can be much further back. I agree. If people have a, <clears throat> a breadth of experience, and that's what's what so important that parents do for their children is give them a broader experience of everything that there is in the world. Yeah. So you obviously <laughs> knew you had an interest in in the craft and when you're a teenager you went to Copenhagen to visit the um, the master craftsman cabinet makers was that your did you decide to go on your own or was that a school trip or how, how what was that trip all about no uh, a, a friend and I and and our parents thought it would be a good idea if we set off uh, and we did that a couple of years running um, and uh, Den Permanente in Copenhagen was a showroom and at the uh, each year, they'd have a competition between cabinet makers for the best piece of furniture that year. Yeah. And it was all a national event. And it was terribly secret <laughs> until the actual day of the announcement. And, you know, that was you know so thrilling that that culture cared enough about furniture yeah. to have this national event. So was it after that you realised this is something you wanted to do forever? Seeing, were you really inspired by the work you saw and the craftsmen? No, I think I was still heading for university at that stage, um, partially because my father really wanted me to go to university. What um, did you study? I, di I didn't go. Oh, you, you said um, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, rather ironic, really. He actually died in my last year at school. Oh, okay. And I suddenly felt I can make the decision I want to make now. And I just wonder how many people, and I know a lot of young people, are fulfilling their parents' f yeah. ambitions rather than their own. And, um, you know, there's another example of it. So where did you uh, decide to train in the end? It was a real struggle. I went to Gordon Russell's and they said to me, um, you know, you want an apprenticeship. And that they, they knew that I really wanted to run my own business. Yeah. Uh, and it was very, very hard to find anywhere. 
I finished up going to a man called Keith Cooper, uh, Lichima Travers in Dorset, uh, and he, he, the thing he said to me more than uh, that he was most concerned about is just, don't expect to make a living now. Yeah. So why don't you train to be a teacher, which you can do by distance learning course in your spare time and weekends, and then when you fail as a furniture maker, uh, you'll have that as a fallback. Okay. And I did it. Yeah. And actually what was so good was that learning to teach about design and making brought me into contact with all the books and the, the philosophy and the, uh, the roots of the arts and crafts movement uh, and the philosophy of design. Education is so important and passing on the knowledge. But now in a lot of schools, the creative subjects and the design technology is being taken out of the curriculum. Um, and I feel that, you know, there's, you've still got the, the, the further education courses like Ryko Wood and the Building Crafts College. But if you haven't got the courses in the school, how do they know it's an option? What do you think that can be done to encourage the young people to start making again and, and know that it's an option? It's interesting. It, it's something which um, the Victoria Museum is particularly addressing yeah, uh, and uh, thankfully Tristram Hunt, the director, recognises that you know, people need contact with materials at an early age to, to discover any kind of sensitivity and enthusiasm for that. Uh, there's an exhibition opened within the furniture galleries, which is part of the event I'm supporting, which is a collection of, of fresh new things made particularly from copies and small material. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there it is in these galleries of fantastic historical furniture. But there, there's all this fresh wood as a central feature. Yeah. Uh, and a film about forestry uh, and about design and making. And so it's, you know, how many children can we get to go to the V&A? That would be wonderful to yeah. see them in there. Well, they, they have a fantastic furniture. Uh, a gallery in the V&A that I visited a few times. You mentioned that the live wood uh, and the, you know, you're, you're an advocate for using British timber. Mm. Can you tell us why it's so important to use locally sourced timber? If we don't use the trees we grow, then of course there's no means of supporting them. Trees, like any crop, need to be looked after. Yeah. So it's the seed selection and the silviculture of drawing those trees up to become like a cathedral columns, and it's something fantastic. And, you know, so much woodland is just chaos. It's just yeah. ab abandoned. And uh, sadly, some of major organisations in this country don't regard forestry as about great, creating a crop as well as providing the habitat, wildlife and the social and other economic benefits. Um, so it's important to use our timber because some of our woods are the best in the world. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a misunderstanding that cutting trees down is bad, but yes. it can encourage new life in the woodlands and, and, and new plants start to grow because more light is being brought down to, you know, floor bed, if, if that's what it's yes. called. Yes. Um, but, you know, the crazy statistic that 80% of our used timber is imported, mm -hmm. but we do have enough wood here to use for furniture making. Yes, I, I think what, there's a mismatch. Um, from the 18th century, when, of course, we were using a lot of our so-called forests, which would have been quite low-grade forest, um, for fuel, for the Industrial Revolution. And as a result, we started importing then, and our trades and, uh, tended to move to the ports where the timber was coming in. And, and so the forests, the well-managed forests that uh, were part of the major estates and have been for centuries, um, were then isolated from the manufacturing. And one of the most desirable things is to get manufacturing taking place where timber is being grown. Yeah. Yes. So there's a natural relationship between the forester and his cust end customer, the, the, the manufacturer. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and since that time, really, there's been a, dis a, a mismatch between forestry and the, the market. Uh, and so little pockets of timber are sold here to there to everywhere. 
and they're transported significant distances. Mm. Well, it's so much better if the whole crop, which of course at early stages, there's a lot of small timber comes out of a crop, which could be a local industry in itself. Yeah. And then of course there's the final crop, which is um, you know, highly valuable and may well uh, travel further afield <laughs> because it's so valuable. Um, but forestry needs that interchange and, and without it, 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 it's economically quite tricky. So we really want makers to be thinking about what are the local crops, what's available, and and one of the interesting things about the exhibits, these new exhibits of the V&A, they've all been made from small timber, okay. and they have a freshness. So in these galleries of very historic pieces, they're this fresh uh, ash, a yeah. collection of modern furniture um, in the middle of, of walnut. I think people need to s sort of see it as like a vegetable patch in the garden is right next mm. to the kitchen mm. you know so you don't have that that transport cost i think exactly. if people think thought the same way with uh, furniture making and using local timber then you know it's going to help the environment as you know as well we've got some beautiful looking timber as well some of the mm. best uh, woods in the world are in this country yes yes i suppose one would encourage people to think longer term too you know, we, we tend to want timber immediately that's dry and ready to use. Yeah. Um, if we could develop thinking that, you know, timber like wine, even beer, needs a while yeah. uh, to yeah. become its best. Uh, and, and so if one can plan to have a stock of timber for one's future projects uh, and just maybe buy what you need immediately, but then put a stock in of something that you could be planning for in the future. So was that the philosophy of Hook Park that I know you're associated with, with building those amazing structures there that is, there's a workshop right in the woodland? Yes, I mean, Hook was really interesting. It's a fairly typical in the sense that it was 50% conifer, 50% hardwood, uh, both beech and oak particularly, and some ash. Um, but the conifer crops um, were the ones that were most neglected uh, and when uh, crops are neglected, they grow taller and taller and taller until the point is they're inclined to fall over. Um, well, that was the threat for quite a lot of the conifer stands. And it struck me that, that there was this material which was from, say, five centimetres diameter upwards, uh, which is really quite substantial. <coughs> How could we use this timber better in, in uh, developing a new campus and yeah. as a major material? And one of the in intriguing things to me, when I talked, about, talked with Fry Otter, who was the architect and engineer we wanted to in involve, about thinnings, he said, well, of course, what their, their very best property is their, their strength in tension. And I suppose yeah. I'd compare that with pulling a matchstick apart lengthwise. No, it's so strong, yeah. we can't do it. And yet, oh, we, we can so easily snap it between our thumb and first finger. Yeah. And so we're using timber's worst property most commonly. Yes. I mean, isn't that ironic? Right. I've seen some of the, the pictures of the, these structures that right. all, all the beams are in tension. Well, that, that's the third component. When you take a, a stick that's flexible and you bend it, it becomes stiff. Yes. Right now, th that means that these trees, which were, as I say, down to five centimeter diameter, are bent over an arch. They form a very strong arch, and you can then la make a lattice that becomes like an eggshell. So it's what's known as lightweight structures, yeah. um, using um, a science as opposed to a purely our tradition way of taking a big tree and cutting it into little bits. Yeah. It, it, not only is, is it a good use of the timber, it is incredible to look at because there's, you know, buildings aren't made like that, you know, and I think more should be, definitely. Well, it, it's certainly material of the place because we built that site entirely out of timber that was needing to be taken out of the woods to improve them. Uh, and they, they take several forms, as you would imagine, some... Um, uh, some in, in an arched form. In another case, we've used their tension and they're a sagging form. So there's a ridge and the timber's hung from the ridge okay. down to the eaves. Uh, and that, that curvature, again, becomes three-dimensional <clears throat> so that it doesn't flap in the wind because with wind, of course, not any pressure, 
it's suction. Yes. And uh, that's why the roofs lift off in gales. Yeah. <coughs> so why was Hook Park created? At Parnham, we taught people to um, make very fine one-off things. And it struck me that that was enough, as it were. Yeah. And really what I wanted to see come out of Hook was this sense of closer integration between forestry and uh, the making of things, buildings and products. And uh, whilst I was directing it, um, that was where we had a quite clear uh, goal for that. I I retired at um, what stage? At nineteen? Uh, sorry, two thousand and one, and handed over to a new director. Yeah. And um, they didn't take that forward, but. What has gone forward is the through collaboration with the Architectural Association, Hook is now their out of London base. Uh, so one's trying to get a generation of architects to actually understand forestry and timber in a way that's not just um, facades and, and cladding. Yeah, and there's a, there's a workshop there, and there's is what what's predominantly the work done in the location. Uh, they build buildings, um, so uh, they run a programme called Design and Build and groups of students, uh, three, four, five students work on one project and produce a building. Uh, the biggest of those so far is a, a new workshop, which is, um, uh, what was important for them was to be able to get access with a four wheel uh, forklift truck. Yes. getting into a building to make components. So it's big enough to make building components inside and then move them to uh, another location on the site. And do you have a sawmill on the site that you can teach uh, the drying process? And... Uh, there is a portable sawmill, yes, yes. Um, of course, what's changed a little bit over time is that the crop has matured, so there are fewer thinnings at this stage. Yes. Um, and one of the things they've done most recently is to take forked, uh, trees that were forked and used uh, analyzing those forks digitally yeah and designing those forks into a structure oh wow so forming a, a, a compression structure which of course then becomes a bridge over yeah. which you can put a roof yeah i guess you know the cross section of a tree you don't you wouldn't need it at a joint then if it's just a branch coming off in that direction well, all the joints were then cut by robot because yeah. digitally you could control what each joint, what it, where it needed to be and what form it might take. Yeah. Well, I wanted to cover on uh, that technology, actually, because when you first started, obviously, I can imagine it's very traditional. Mm -hmm. And then CNC started coming about. Right. What was that, that stage in your career? Were you hesitant to involve the use of digital fabrication in work at the beginning? Or did you realise this is fantastic technology and you wanted to incorporate in your work? At Hook, we were working with very uh, eminent structural engineers and architects. Yeah. And so, yes, digital technology was an integral part for them. At that stage, the, the issues were ones of how to, if you bend timber, how do you join it where it's really at the top? If you're um, wanting to create a continuous length of timber um, longer than the tree is, how do you join that? If you're pulling on timber, how do you get hold of it on an end joint that yes. is as strong as the timber? Yes. Fascinating. And a combination of um, a steel pin, yeah. uh, epoxy resin, but only one, five, only 5% five epoxy resin, 95% wood dust okay. within that joint. So I know some of your furniture in, in some of the, I've seen some of the, the legs joined into the seat with threaded bolts uh, with, with epoxy. Yep. I mean, what was thrilling was to be working with engineers and technology developed with Imperial College and three or four universities across Europe, uh, and then to be able to bring that and apply it to the furniture because it's great things possible that couldn't, just couldn't be done before. Yeah. It's amazing that we're still thinking of new new ways of doing things because it always was, you know, tenons, um, but you're now discovering, you know, threaded bolts, what you can do, and it's a, it's a much stronger joint. Yes, this this is all to do with, with complementary materials. You know, wood isn't good at everything. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that um, 
in the purest simply, simply you've got to do everything in wood. Yeah. And you know, it's not it's not the best use of our resources. Um, there are complementary materials is that sort of understanding what is needed in a particular location. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it's fundamental to design, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can produce a chair with three legs and, and, and you know, very simple, one seat and one back. And that's possible because we're getting high performance from the materials we're using. Yes. And you started to incorporate cast bronze in your work. Yes, in a very rather different vein. I mean, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, that's quite a, a decorative element, but I find it hugely complementary to certain woods. I yeah. mean, mulberry, which is an absolute favourite wood. Um, and that and bronze, whether it's brightly polished or whether it's weathered and, and uh, yeah. patinated. Hmm. So do you work, do you bring specialists into your workshop and you collaborate with them, people who are specialists in different fields like cast bronze? Uh, yes, we, we make the patterns yeah. and then we work the foundry. Uh, they tell us how much bigger the patterns have got to be than the parts we want. Because there's some shrinkage at all. Yes. Um, and um, uh, uh, yes, and then I'd also work with, with structural engineers sometimes on some of the big tables we make because there's yes. three legs supporting a vast tabletop. Uh, mm. There are quite a lot of stresses in that. And sometimes the piece has to be assembled on site uh, when it's delivered finally in Hong Kong or yeah. Nairobi or wherever it's going. So with your pieces, you are now focusing more on the design element and you have a, a team of skilled makers who can bring your ideas to life? I have a small team, yes. Yeah. Did you um, used to be more into the making or was it always design at the forefront? Uh, I was making um, quite obsessively until 1976, yes. which is when we moved from uh, Warwickshire to Dorset, to Farnham, uh, and in moving to Dorset, we were setting up a, um, a, in a historic house, both a school uh, and um, my own studios with 10 staff uh, and a house open to the public. And so it's no longer feasible for me to have the scope for concentration on making in the way that I'd enjoyed previously. Are a lot of the pieces you make now your ideas, your designs, or do you sometimes work with a client and, or, and, and, and they give you a brief and you try and fit that, or is it purely what you want to make? Uh, it's pretty much what I want to make, really. Yeah. Um, that sounds like the dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's, it's the, it takes a while. You know, I can remember some early commissions where people were terribly tight on budget and at the end of the day, they weren't happy. Uh, and gradually, I suppose actually one of the stages I should talk about was that um, quite early on, when I was trying to think, well, who are my customers? Uh, and there were the general public out there. Yeah. Uh, and they weren't really thinking about it. And I could exhibit and that might prompt one or two people. But it was shops that had to buy in order to sell. And so I um, created a small range of products, a low table and some woodware uh, and a chair. And so now I got, so I got a target. I could, get, I could walk into heels, I could carry in a piece of furniture and put it down on the floor and they'd um, say, oh, come into my office. Um, and, you know, I'd walk out with an order for initially six and 12 and then 20 and 60. And so the numbers just he grew huge. Yeah. Too much for us to cope with, really. But what was important was one was actually generating revenue for a small workshop that was continuous. Uh, and it, it got so big that in the end we had to manufacture uh, elsewhere. Do you have any advice for anyone who does want to get their work into s galleries or shops? Well, galleries, one thing, I mean, it always seems to me what we make as, as craftspeople is not what people actually want. Yeah. It's what we wanted. Uh, and we're not terribly good at actually trying to assess what people are really thinking. 
Um, but some, some simple products into retail is an easier route, it seems to me, rather than the, the, the gallery. Um, mm. uh, just the design retailers are always looking for distinctive products. Yes. Uh, and if you have design ideas and they're well um, refined, reduced, reduced minimised, cut back, improved, developed, improved, developed, until you've got something really manufacturable, yes. uh, 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 but stunning, um, then retailers would be interested. They would be interested, yeah. Mm. So you've made so many pieces, but is there something that you haven't tried yet that you want to, or an, an exciting project you're, uh, you've got coming up? That you're worried uh, yes, about, yes, or so, yes, something yes, challenging. Yes. yes. Um, well, it's it's interesting because you would hardly believe it, but we've done a series of dining tables, which have similar features, but each time they're a they're a total new challenge. Yeah. Um, because they're different size, different shapes, probably different materials, um, and um, I, I rather I rather love that process. It's not very often that we get commissions for things like chests of drawers. I mean, they're very labor intensive. Uh, and the world has, seems to have moved so much towards built-in storage that chests of drawers aren't necessarily a part of people's necessities. Yeah. Uh, whereas dining tables and chairs are something which, you know, no house you buy comes with its table and chairs. Yeah, uh, which is why I found it a, a wonderful subject, and and you know, table and chairs can be a very. Uh, we have just working on a, a set of eighteen chairs and three tables, and tables that that nest into one another, um, <clears throat> uh, which we've been working on for eighteen months, nearly two years. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's a very expensive project. Yeah, well, looking at your work, they definitely there's a lot that goes into it, and mm. you have the time, you know, it justifies it. I think a lot of people would be interested to find out about your designing process and where you find inspiration. And is it all sketched? Do you do any uh, computer design yourself? Or? I don't do any computer design, no. Um, I probably should, but um, I, I I really enjoy working with other people who are damn good at what they do. Yes, yeah, so um, my design process is one of, I really like to write down what it is we're trying to achieve. And, you know, very often, I, you might use the word table, well, you know, to me now, I want to know what, what you're going to do at this table. So I try and turn... Um, nouns into verbs okay what's the activity going to be yes is it going to be conversation is it going to be relaxing is it going to be you know what the, the series of whatever those activities are and that then frees you from that preconception of what a table looks like yeah because you're you're responding to the human requirements for that activity and i think that that's uh, one thing that i found very very uh, constructive, uh, particularly with storage furniture. Um, uh, I find people don't very well understand chairs, and, and many designers don't. Yeah, and why uh, is that? Well, because they think about, I, th I think they're more inclined to think about the form of the chair before they think of the form of the body. Yeah, and what a chair should look like. A lot of chair yeah. should, yes. Um, you know, what's more beautiful than the human frame? Yeah. There's, that's a pretty <laughs> glorious start yeah. to making something to support it. Out of the Woodwork is brought to you by Axminster Tools. Nobody is more passionate or knowledgeable about woodworking than us. A market leader in mail order tools and the machinery industry, we offer a friendly and personal service to thousands of woodworkers all around the world. Whether you're a trade professional, business owner, education leader, amateur DIYer, or a hobby enthusiast, we share your passion. Discover more about Axminster Tools, visit www.axminstertools.com. So looking at your work, 
I see there's a lot of nature and, and some organic shapes. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a style you've developed over time? Uh, were you inspired by someone to incorporate leaves and branches in you know the chair backs? Yes, yeah, so a, a chair is in, should inherently, in my mind, be an organic form, uh, mm -hmm. certainly in, in certain aspects how you support it, how it could be something different. But uh, similarly, with a, a table, I and mean, we've done a series of tables which have a sort of leaf form, and I love that sense of a leaf rising from a leg, yes. and actually having legs otherwise which disappear, as it were, so you almost get this leaf floating. Yeah. In cabinets, um, less so, although that flow series uh, with a sort of wave form, um, yeah. uh, it has organic feel to it, I suppose. And I, that was very interesting to me, doing that series, in that making a, a cabinet, you know, many of us will spend our time and our efforts producing the most beautifully flat surface. Mm -hmm. Then you will hear this, there's this beautiful ripple ash. What happens if I carve into it and I get sculpted into it? Well, suddenly the thing becomes so much more interesting. Uh, and so that, that sort of fetish over producing perfection of flatness yeah which i want inside because of the, the you know draw movement so on yeah. but it doesn't have to be outside yes it could be more expressive and i think that's one of the things that i think craftspeople have tended to do is they've become very mechanical in producing you know beautiful joints uh but actually where's the joy yeah. you know what's going to communicate this to other people and that to me is what design is about, is about communication. And, and frankly, beautiful craftsmanship doesn't necessarily convey that. Yeah, I'm sure there's not an easy answer to this question, but all of your pieces, you know, are very unique and, and they each have their own style. For a, a maker out there who is struggling and wanting to design something unique, it seems like everything's been done. Do you have any uh, tips on on even the starting point of for sketching, on where they can go to try and come up with something unique? Well, I think you've got to be prepared to throw away at least 10 ideas, maybe 100. Yes. Um, and, and just keep sketching, really. Uh, but, of course, we're all working within our, within our bounds. And, you know, my bounds were the same as everybody else's bounds to start with. Yeah. And we produced pretty dreary things. <laughs> Do you remember some of your early pieces? Uh, yes, yes. What were they? Um, well, I, you know, just making a chest of drawers and of the sheer amount of work that goes into that. Uh, and, you know, all you do is, you know, you spend a lot of time, as I was saying, trying to produce these beautifully flat surfaces. Yeah. And, and over time you think, well, go hell, you know, let's, let's go for something more interesting. And, and so it's a growth thing, really. You know, where you start isn't where you're going. It's the yeah. next step on. And, and that's really how life is, why life is so exciting. So if someone is, yeah, not finding it difficult in the early stage, it's just if you keep pushing yourself, ideas yes. will come and, and experience. You know, you know, since I've started, I, mm. I'm looking at my early pieces. I don't actually have my early pieces because my mum didn't like the look of them and chucked them away. <laughs> I'm not sure if you still have your early pieces, but I'm, mm. I'm very happy with the things I'm making at the moment. Mm. Yes, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, because you've, have you found a, a, an expression that suits, suits you, as it were? Yeah, I, I've, I'm asked a lot, what's your style? But I like to make different things. You know, I like to try new processes. A lot of my pieces, you know, people have told me, that they've seen all my pieces and they can see, you know, the similarity. But when I look at them, I think they all look different because I, yes. I, I do like the Japanese style in some. And I think depending on, I, I'm a big fan of bent lamination um, and I'm a fan of, uh, of Hans J. Wegener and mm. his work. I, he's one of my uh, design inspirations. Mm. So I think if someone's looking at some of my furniture, they can see the similarities there. But yeah, I don't think I want to be tied down to a specific style because I'm always coming up with ideas of new things right. I want to try. You talk of laminating, uh, uh, two-dimensional two laminating? Well, I've tried compound curves as well in yes. free forms, yes. uh, which are uh, very hard to do. That's the exciting bit. Yes, well, I agree. And <laughs> coming up with a design where you, you don't know how it's going to be made, 
I'm really, I love trying to figure out how to do something that I haven't done before. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think three-dimensional laminating has real industrial potential. Yeah. Um, because, again, the organic form, I mean, our needs are not parallel and rectilinear. Yeah. Um, so have you seen uh, Joseph Walsh's um, bent lamination, his, his chairs, and what, what do you think about that style? Um, well, we're, we're quite close mates, really. Um, and... Uh, uh, we've both been talking to the family at Chatsworth. Yes. Uh, and he's, he's actually made a set of chairs, I think he's done 24, all different. And I'm concerned that, you know, some of them aren't very comfortable, but, you know, they're all very beautiful. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, how wonderful that, you know, a patron is prepared to commission 24 different dining chairs for a room that is quite gorgeous. Well, I'm jealous that uh, you're, you're good friends with him. I'd like to meet him one day because he's inspired some of my pieces as well. Yes. Well, I was quite lucky to sit on uh, one of your chairs uh, made out of bog oak in the carpenter's hall, uh, the, the chair you did there. Right. I have to say, when I sat on that, I thought it was the nicest made chair I'd ever sat on. It, the, the finish you got on it mm. and just, just so tactile and so smooth. It's the, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased with that chair, and we've gone on to do a sequel to it as a dining chair. Yeah, I think uh, I've seen those. The, the, yes. the back's a bit low on those ones. Yes, yes, that's it, yes. But um, no, that was, that was a, um, a, a, an interesting development. How many prototypes uh, do you do before you get to a final design? They're almost all on screen. Oh, okay. Mm. And then the, the first one you make normally is, is the real thing. Yep. Um, we might do a mock-up. I mean, I very much like the idea of, of um, getting to a drawing for the client to see and then actually making a mock-up of that, which may be just you know, plywood or any materials yeah. to get that sort of form, and then sitting them in it. To s and we did that with the chair recently. And um, the couple commissioning it, and she's a very pretty small actress, and he's a huge rugger player. Okay. And each of them sat it, and they just both seemed to grow. You know, they just and that was what I wanted to know was whether it would work for them both. Well, yeah, so many chairs seem to be suited for one type, one mm. size. And mm. um, yeah, that's incredible that that you know two completely different <laughs> yeah. styles fit perfectly. So going back to the British hardwoods, uh, yes. what materials do you use? And because and, we have such a variety. We do. And the, the, the thing I find most tantalising is that some woods are really quite rare. So things like mulberry that we mentioned, um, it, it is really hard to come by. But the first tree I had was from one of, one of the, the Physic Garden in London. It was about this in diameter. And we made so many wonderful things out of that. But I've never managed to find more of it. Uh, uh, yes. Only in, in the occasional trees blow down in gales. But it, it seems some of the most beautiful things are, are also the rarest. Some of the most common things are relatively uninteresting. So beech, for example, which has been used for good, but, but um, not necessarily very interesting furniture, yeah. over a long period, um, it has a grain which you know, doesn't have any great appeal. Yes, this is beach, I'm pretty sure. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then in between those two, you've got so many varieties. I mean, there's things like a wild cherry wood, which is a delightful wood. And, you know, we, get, we import cherry wood from America, but, oh, it's so boring by comparison with our English one. Yeah. Uh, there's um, sycamore. And of course, particularly ripple sycamore, yeah. which is in, uh, an inch, I mean, you know, often with grain we associate with musical instruments and that wonderful uh, um, uh, timbre that it has. Uh, oak, of course. And, and interestingly, I don't like oak just finished with a clear finish. I, I really adore it when it's scrubbed and bleached. So yeah. it's like. Um, uh, like the back stairs of a, a, a historic house or uh, um, 
uh, but bleached oak has great properties. And then we also torch it. I was going to say, I've seen some of your furniture sort of ebonized. Yes, yeah. so scorching it. And actually that really pulls the grain out. Yeah. Uh, and so it takes on another texture. Yeah. And when we, when we make a seat of some of our chairs, we, we layer it. And then we carve through the layers and then we scorch it. And you get all this pattern. Yeah, right. so, pattern yeah. uh, it's really uh, exciting. Um, and there's and then ash, which of course sadly is not going to be available for a long while. Yeah. yeah, for the people that don't know about the ash dieback disease, can you talk about that and and, yes. and what's going to happen? Ash has been one of the timbers that people have planted most commonly in the last thirty years, and a lot of the plants have uh, are of one kind. Many of them have been imported from Holland. And sadly, they've all suffered the same disease. Yeah. Uh, and um, they're just dying. Um, so the trees are being, you know, now there's an obligation to cut those trees down in order not to provide the diseased ones. The diseased trees yeah. dying. Yes. So do you think there's a way of keeping, keeping them alive? There's, there's major research into that. Uh, and um, of course, too late, really. Really? So we're not going to be using ash in the future? No, I think the trees that have been rescued will be on the market for a while. Um, oak is suffering, um, and of course climate change being a factor. So one of the things that may happen in our woodlands is that we may find ourselves introducing other species from warmer climates that may survive. But I, I've not come across any that are more beautiful than the tree, trees which have grown here for aeons. Yeah, it's such a shame. Do you, will mm. people s start to store it and it be worth a lot of money? It's going to be worth like gold if, if, if there's one piece of ash left. Someone's, yes. someone's going to pay a lot of money for that. It's a bit like that. Um, uh, sadly, the raw materials never command the, the, the value that the finished work does. But, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, it doesn't become that inflated. So what woods do you use most often in your furniture or do you always change it up? Well, I just, just one other rare one. I mean, holly is a great favourite for me. Um, and um, uh, that, of course, because of its whiteness. It's almost yes. like an ivory. Yeah. Uh, a, a wonderful contrast, of course, because it's so white and so plain uh, by comparison with almost any other wood. Um, I don't think what else. And you would. You know, the grain of you is incredible. And, and so often difficult to find a, a, clean, a clean trunk. And then, of course, bog oak, which being dug up still, which is black as, or charcoal to black. Um, and, and so you've got this big range from holly to bog oak, all from within the UK. Yes. I suppose for, for most users, they don't know where to find timbers. Um, and of course, there are sawmills which specialise in, in cutting British timber. Uh, they're widely scattered, um, but there's one in most regions. And there's always sawmills in your area if you have a tree of your own or you know someone who's going to tree cut down, because mm. often it's just been cut up for firewood. But if, mm. if, if you know someone's going to tree cut down, you can, you, can get it, you can ask for a portable sawmill to come to location or, or send it away and, yeah. and dry it yourself. I think you're better placed than we are in Dorset. Yeah, there's more. There's more interest and more tip, more forestry, I suspect. Uh, but yes, you're you're right. So, John, you're sponsoring the Making Good Project: uh, Rethinking Materials Future, which is in the VNA. Can you tell us a bit more about that and the work you're doing? Yes, I think after COP26, we're all very aware now that we are having an impact on the environment, almost whatever we do. Yes, and one of the exciting things would be to actually reinforce this use of renewable materials, particularly from our own areas. Uh, if we want trees, then we need to use them, give them value at the end of the day so that others can be planted. Um, but the project uh, Make Good, Rethinking Material Futures, is uh, uh, about understanding nature and how we can uh, source things more sustainably in the long term. And this is not only timber, uh, it's likely to include textiles, um, probably fungi, 
uh, yeah. all sorts of other ways that nature can work with us. Yeah. But the main focus is, is trees and timber. And that's where we started with the symposium this year. Uh, and we had um, a, a wonderful young designer and maker who is living in a coppice, has a coppice nearby, and he's making things to order for clients. And there may well be components which are still raw. Yes. Um, and then um, on this last occasion, we had Gabriel Hemery, who is a director of the Silver Foundation in Oxfordshire. Yes. An organisation which is uh, very much concerned with the, the management of woodlands, with the better use of timber, with encouraging small industries in timber, even workshops where people can start a workshop, where people can get going um, with their business before they set out independently. But most extraordinarily, they are also dealing with farmers across the country who have so little idea of how to look after woodland. Yeah. It's not part of their culture. Yeah. Uh, they think planting trees is a good idea, and indeed it is. Uh, but they don't know what a commitment it is to look after them yeah. for, for generations. Actually yeah. bringing those trees up clean and straight so they have some value rather than being firewood. Yeah. Well, is it, what, what can be done about that? Is, is this project to educate the farmers and, and people around the issues? Well, certainly in the case of Silver Foundation, yes, it is. But then we also had speakers from, from Kew um, talking about what are the essential rules for reforestation. And actually some of those relate particularly to understanding what's already there. What grows in this part of the world? What grows yeah. well? And... and um, if there are surviving species, then let's um, take a sign from those as to what to do for the future. Um, but there are also those whole things of interface between uh, woodlands and the, and the community. Yeah. Uh, how, how do we make woodlands work for, for every bit of the economy and the environment and the, and the society around um, those are all, um, they're all possible. And you believe that yeah. craftsmen yeah. themselves should consider themselves as a small industry and, and if, if, it, if all the craftsmen work together, uh, then they can make a difference, even though they might just be on their own in their workshop. Yes, it could be individuals or hopefully those with such energy and, and ideas that they run a bigger business. Yes. Because that's better for all of us. Yeah. Well, John, it's been great talking to you. I've learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners uh, really have enjoyed it. So thank you for talking to me today. You're very welcome. Thank you, Sean. Join us again next time for another episode of Out of the Woodwork. For more episodes, to listen and subscribe, search for Out of the Woodwork on all major podcast sites, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. For more woodworking project guides, demos, tools, reviews, and more, visit www.axminstertools.com.